So our first speaker is a, is a very experienced um, speaker, and it's Nicole Blishma, and she's going to be cre uh, talking about creating a healthy home. Now, Nicole, I've heard her speak many, many times, and she certainly is a woman of passion, and her passion lies in environmental medicine. I'm sure you're going to see that in a minute. She's an accomplished naturopath, acupuncturist, and she's an accredited mould re remediation technician and building biologist. It sounds like a mouthful. And she began her clinical practice in 1989, so she's, been, uh, she's uh, very experienced. She's an author of the bestseller Healthy Home, Healthy Family, uh, and I can recommend that book. It's a very good book, and I think it's what in it's about fifth edition now, isn't it, Nicole? Something like that. Third edition. Uh, and she's also been a col columnist for Body and Soul, which is the Herald Sun, and she's frequently consulted by the media to comment on health hazards in the built environment. So she's had about 30 years' experience lecturing at tertiary educations and published in a number of peer-reviewed so, uh, journals. So if you'd like to join me in welcoming Nicole. Thank you so much, Kylie. What I'd like to do today is to talk about my work as a building biologist, which essentially means I walk into people's homes to see if they're making them sick. We liaise with mould remediators, plumbers, electricians, uh, builders, architects, etc., building inspectors, uh, in order to determine and rectify sick buildings. But my journey began many years ago as a result of two events that happened in my life. Firstly, I started to notice a really strong connection between many of my patients' illnesses in their homes. And by the third consultation, many of my patients with chronic fatiguing-like illnesses and chronic neurodegenerative disorders would be saying, do you think the visible mould in my bedroom is a problem? Now, having spent um, eight years at uni, doing a double degree, went to China in the early 90s to do more studies in TCM at the Guangzhou TCM Hospital, we never touched on environmental medicine, indoor air quality, electromagnetic fields, allergens. But it wasn't until I moved into our own home in Warrandyte in this beautiful place, and the moment we moved in there, my husband and I experienced insomnia, which was insidious, and it just got worse and worse. And of course, I didn't even think that the home could be playing a role. Within the first 12 months, I fell pregnant unexpectedly. That's always a bit of a shock. But within 12 weeks, miscarried, and subsequently had 10 miscarriages in this house. When I was speaking to the neighbour about what was going on, she said, oh, you will know when successfully had children in this home, despite the fact that it was over 65 years old. So I started to look at what was going on with the home that could have been contributing to our illness because no one in Australia from the recurrent women's recurrent miscarriage clinic, IVF, etc., haematologists, immunologists could explain why I was miscarrying. So I started to look at the house and I realised we were sleeping on the other side of the wall of the metre panel. And when I started to look at the research on AC magnetic fields and, and recurrent miscarriages, there was a, about four research uh, papers on miscarriage risk that has subsequently increased significantly in the last 12 years since I've looked at that arena. Did the house cause my miscarriages or not? Well, no one will ever know. At the same time, when I started to get into indoor air quality, I measured that traffic-related air pollutants like carbon monoxide will triple in our master bedroom because we were closest to the T intersection. And as the traffic would accumulate in the peak hour in the morning and then again later on in the afternoon, I noticed that and measure it would take about three hours for carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide to dissipate from our master bedroom because the traffic related air pollution would come into the garage and straight up through our, our floorboards and into our room and take about three hours to dissipate before the next peak hour traffic kicked in. And that was real shock for me because, you know, I'd spent $60,000 on a double degree 30 years ago and thinking, what on earth are we missing? What are we doing if we're just giving shopping bags full of stuff to patients if we're not getting to the cause of their patient's condition? So as a result of that, I established the industry building biology in Australia. And as I mentioned, that means going into people's homes to see if they're making them sick. Because to me, our homes are the elephant in the room. For example, we'll often find, uh, for example, that people's homes will considerably make them sick. Sometimes I'll go into a house and there'll be water damage in one part of a bedroom where there's no potential source of moisture, no plumbing, nothing. And I'll ask the client to go, what on earth is going on in that part of the house? And, and she'll say, that's where the dog urinates. That's where the dog likes to urinate. Well, Mrs Smith, 
This is why we can't get a clearance on that air sample because it's the microbial activity as a result of that is affecting the air sampling and the results from the lab. So we often find, you know, other audits, in fact, one audit I did two years ago with my building biology students, we're standing in the middle of a child's room who has significant asthma and allergies. Fair enough, the pillows and the mattresses are over 20 years old, loaded with dust mites and, you know, moisture, etc. But what really piqued my interest as I walked into this room is that there's an aviary. In the child's room, there's a freaking aviary man. And I'm standing there going, what do you think's wrong with this space, guys? To my 15 building biologists and going, if they don't miss the aviary over in that side of the room, they're all failing, because there's an aviary. Um, so this is the thing. I'm here to say there's actually an elephant in all of your patients' homes. And whether it's the pesticides in their household dust, the flame retardants that are very strongly correlated with autism and even neurodegenerative disorders, it's in all of our homes when everything went pear-shaped just after the changes in farming practices in the 1950s and 60s. So we now know genetics loads the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. And in particular, since completion of the Human Genome Project in the year 2003 and failure of genome-wide association studies to correlate um, illnesses to genes, we realise that the environment plays a major part in most chronic illnesses. And in particular, we know that most of those triggers, whether it's toxins like solvents, VOCs, uh, toxic metals like mercury and lead, fungi, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, or even plasticizers, phthalates, and chemicals in food, that it all causes um, nitrosative stress or increased peroxy nitride free radicals at a cellular level, which can result in long-term low-grade inflammation. Most chronic illnesses we now are very strongly correlated with low-grade inflammation, and many of these are triggers, triggers of this. So to understand any disease, you must first understand both the person and the place in which the disease occurred. According to Hippocrates, of course, who is the father of medicine. And as I mentioned, genetics loads the gun, but it's the environment, it's our diet, it's our lifestyle, and our home in which we live that triggers this. So as part of my PhD, looking at substantial variations in illnesses from things like asthma, there's a 41-fold variation in developing asthma depending on where you live. And this is strongly correlated to things like um, proximity to coal mines, to traffic-related air pollution, um, and to industry. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, 75-fold increased risk depending on where you live. Geelong has one of the highest sources of ADHD or, or hyperactivity disorder in children's very close to the port, high amount of industry, strong related to traffic related air pollutants and major uh, freeways. So many potential triggers. Alzheimer's frequently comes up with uh, farming and agricultural areas as a result of pesticide exposure. Um, if you look at the incidences of cancers, they actually very strongly correlate to the inner regional areas of Australia. And that box should actually be through that entire line. You can find the inner regional areas have high levels for almost every types of these types of cancers. And this is where the orange parts are in the map. If you look at the inner regional areas, they're the areas where manufacturing happens. This is where the coal trains tend to come through. Often they're agricultural fields as well and mining. So air pollution hotspots based on the environmental justice movement report. Coal uh, mining map of Australia, uh, areas of industry, agriculture, traffic related air pollution and coal fired power stations, and agriculture. About half of Australia's total land mass, 385 million hectares, is used for agricultural purposes. Now we know there's Every 60 seconds, another 20 chemicals are registered for use on the world's largest database, the Chemical Abstract Service. Just to put that into context, that's 200,000 new chemicals that are registered on this database through the American Chemical Society every single week. 80 to 90% of these chemicals have never been tested for their impact of the man-made portion of these chemicals have never been tested for their impact on human health. There are currently over 141 million chemicals registered for use on this database. In 2014, more substances were added to the CAS registry, and many of you may recognise the word CAS because it'll be on all the safety data sheets if you're in a workplace, than in the combined years from 1965 to 1990. What that means is large population biomonitoring studies across the world with the largest 
happening in the US, the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey have identified hundreds of, of chemicals in our bodies from the womb to the tomb at levels known to cause adverse health effects. And the latest studies have shown these are the average chemicals found in pregnant women from um, cigarette, tobacco, smoke, cotinine, environmental phenols primarily in cleaning products, uh, toxic metals, organochlorine pesticides, uh, perchlorite, dry cleaning solvents, phthalates in our PVCs and our plastics and our air fresheners and our perfumes and of course in PVC plastic, uh, pro polybrominate diphenyl flame retardants which are of course everywhere, polyaromatic hydrocarbons from vehicle exhaust, PVCs from our non-stick cookware and VOCs from all our solvents, glues and paints. Not a good story. And breast milk is one of the best biomarkers to determine how toxic the environment has become. Now, it's a sad state of affairs when the human species, when breast milk is the best biomarker, where we know that the best way for a woman to reduce her toxic load is to get pregnant and pass it through the placenta to the child and to breastfeed because many of these environmental toxicants are lipophilic, which means they are persistent organic pollutants that love breast milk. That's where they go. That's a problem. And the chemical regulation is just a dog's breakfast. Exposure standards are not geared for public health. They are compromised with the industry to determine what is practicable, practicable in a workplace for a 100 kilo man. They fail to consider mixture effects because they're giving one group of chemicals to a group of rodents and giving them until they establish the LD50 or lethal dose 50 when 50% 50 die and then establishing the adverse health effects. They don't look at the timing and duration of exposure, and we now know this is really important. Uh, one of the first studies on timing of exposure was during the Dutch famine of 1944-1945, where women in the last stage of their pregnancy were starved as a result of the Germans cutting the food to the supply, and my parents are Dutch and they're still, hmm, German Dutch still, haven't forgiven them for the war. And uh, as a result of cutting the food supply, women who were pregnant in their last trimester if the child survived, as an adult, that child had much higher risks for cardiovascular disease and obesity. So it affected the lipogenesis or the number of fat cells and the size of the fat cells and increased their risk for cardiovascular disease, even though it had no impact on the mother. Then there was thalidomide, and then of course there was diethylstilbestrol in the 1960s. Uh, when women took this for both um, nausea and miscarriages, they then had adverse health effects in, in their children. Transgenerational effects where exposure, when the mother is exposed to chemicals and she has a young, a, say a female fetus, by week 14 to 15 the female fetus will have all her eggs. So whatever the mother's exposed to, both her daughter and her future children, her grandchildren will be exposed. The impact of the diet, environment, drugs and lifestyle is completely ignored in the understanding of how chemicals are regulated and most important of all, that the human microbiome is completely different to the rat microbiome and in fact that makes almost every study we've done on chemicals on rats completely null and void. Everything we know about chemicals is completely useless because we fail to consider the impact of the human microbiome. We know the microbiome is more effective than the liver at detoxing chemicals. There are over 865 bacteria that they have recognised that can detox and, and change chemicals and transmute them. For example, if cigarette smoke lands on your skin, Micrococcus, Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus will start breaking it down into different metabolites before it even gets into the blood. A recent paper four weeks ago was published by the National Academy of Sciences on environmental chemicals and the human health and the microbiome to indicate we have absolutely really very little knowledge or understanding of how chemicals are transmuted in the body. However, we need to really start again and do put a lot more research into the microbiome and the bacteria within our bodies and the impact this have on toxicant exposure. And one of the Biggest areas of toxicant exposure is exposure to mould and biotoxins because when you're exposed to biotoxins in a water damaged environment, what happens is the body tries to clear it through the bile, it affects the gut microbiome, it creates huge amounts of metabolites which end up clogging and causing a traffic jam in phase two sulfation pathways in the liver, which means all your catecholamines, your dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, um, serotonin, melatonin are no longer metabolized through the pathway they normally go through. It increases their half-life in the blood and suddenly the patient starts developing anxiety, depression, mood swings, which could actually very strongly be related to their exposure to water damaged buildings. So I would argue mould sensitivities and water damaged buildings are chemical sensitivities that disrupt many, many pathways along the way.
especially toxic and exposure, because when these mole patients are in these environments, they become chemically sensitive for this reason, to environmental chemicals, and then they develop food sensitivities. We know that uh, toxicants are related to almost every chronic disease and as part of my literature review and my PhD I looked at which toxicants are associated with which disease and because I'm running out of time and talking too fast, um, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Pandemic of childhood neurobehavioural disorders in the 1970s, about four to five out of every 10,000 children in Australia were diagnosed with autism. Now, according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, it's one in 35 between the ages of five and 14. That is enormous. If we apply today's diagnostic methods to the 1970s, in the 1970s, it would be about one in, 260, one in 265 children. So it's still escalated significantly. One in 35 Australian children, yep, 11% of children worldwide diagnosed with ADHD. And all of this has changed since the introduction of farming practices which introduce pesticides. Pesticides are antibacterial. They affect the microbiome. Preservatives in every product are antibacterial. They affect the microbiome. Genital malformations in baby boys in Australia alone has increased 2% each year, which of course is a risk factor for testicular dysgenesis or increased risk for testicular cancer. We know sperm count has officially declined by 50% and many of the research or urologists are looking at the impact of hormone disrupting chemicals at the prenatal or during the womb and its impact on male development. Early puberty, of course, young girls now are going to puberty a lot earlier. In the 1900s, it was at the average of age of menarche when they started their period was 16. Now it's as young as seven and eight, with the average age between 10 and 11 in Australia. The younger a child starts her period, the greater the risk for breast cancer. And of course, a massive rise in metabolic disorders. We have words like obesogens now in the scientific literature to associate chemicals with increased risks with obesity. Um, according to Bruce, Professor Bruce Blumberg from the University of California, uh, showing that actually exposure to certain chemicals in the womb could actually make infants a uh, higher risk for obesity before they've even passed food through their mouth. In the past 35 years, new cancer diagnosis in Australia has almost tripled, and many of these cancers are directly related or correlated with hormone disrupting chemicals in everyday plastics, in phthalates, in perfumes, chlorinated water which is affecting the microbiome etc um, and many of the, the chemicals in everyday products and there's lots of cancers and things like that. Allergic disease of course Australia had the second highest rate of allergic disease in um, the world and many of this is correlated with exposures to things like house dust mite but also biotoxins like mould. It's all depressing isn't it? I'm actually going to get to the good stuff in a minute. <laughs> Chemicals also trigger allergies depending on your proximity to traffic related air pollution. So if you live within 200 metres from heavy traffic, like for example um, the road outside here, or where traffic stops and starts, you increase your risk to exposure to particulates, PM2.5, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, many known carcinogens, etc., which can significantly increase your risk for asthma and, asthma and eczema. And of course the rise in environmental sensitivities. So in my first paper, I looked at the chemical assessment in clinical practice and looked at what chemicals were associated with which diseases and pretty much every disease. And the one chemical that came up time and time again are pesticides. Pesticides because they are antibacterial and they affect the human microbiome. In the next study, which will be published in the next two weeks, um, I then determined, well, how do doctors assess chemicals in their patients if chemicals are everywhere? And just to summarise what we ended up finding out by interviewing the top 16 environmental medical doctors in Australia and New Zealand was that A, it's impossible to assess chemical load in a patient um, and the only effective way to establish this and get some idea of this was to take an exposure history. So as a result of this, we looked at developing an exposure history, and this is the next part of my PhD, is developing a survey, um, an exposure history, because when I asked the top environmental doctors in Australia and New Zealand how they assess load, they said laboratory tests are unreliable, tests aren't available for most of the chemicals, we don't know when the chemical is absorbed through the body, how the microbiome affects it, etc. and this is well known in the scientific literature. So the exposure history, they all agreed, was the most important way to assess chemical load. And they all agreed, and they didn't agree on much, was that it takes about 90 minutes to take an effective exposure history. And then they said, if you take 90 minutes with the first, in your first consultation with a patient, you're likely going to get deregistered by Medicare because you're spending too much time with the patient. <laughs> 
So you can see the whole system is completely ridiculous. So Fold3 was a mnemonic that I established as part of my exposure history that I've developed and place history, hobbies, occupational history, lifestyle, such as, for example, cycling near heavy traffic, not a good idea, drugs, diet and dental history. So where are most of these toxicants and how do you deal with this? Well, this is the good news. Food is actually the major source of toxicants. You're going to ingest around 25 tonnes of food in a lifetime and this is where all the uh, toxicants tend to occur. It's really important, therefore, wherever you can to try and uh, eat organic when you can. Now, the Environmental Working Group had their Dirty Dozen. It's very different to the Australian list developed by the um, Friends of the Earth who have the most current list on pesticides in Australian food, which is well worth looking at. But the main ones were apples, of course, and berries came up quite high as well. So if you can't afford organic, at least with, with your fruits and uh, your berries to try and go organic when you can. Of course, we know packaging, real problem. Now, having lectured to naturopathic students over many 12 years, the summary of my nutritional lectures would be try and reduce processed foods in your body, in your food, and find out where your food comes from. Go to local farmers markets so you know where the far who the farmer is and you know where it's actually grown. That's really important because ideally your diet should have um, sustainable and um, organic and whole foods wherever possible. Home is loaded with many chemicals, from our building materials to our furnishings, our clothing. Now, the interesting thing is if you buy, for example, an Australian mattress, the level of formaldehyde will be zero because formaldehyde is a known carcinogen, not allowed. But NICNAS, National Industrial Chemical Notification Assessment Scheme, there are six organisations involved in chemical regulation in Australia, NICNAS doesn't regulate imported goods. How ridiculous is that? That's the loophole. It regulates Australian manufacturers, it doesn't regulate imported goods. Now, when's the last time you bought an, a, an Australian mattress, Australian clothes, Australian chairs, Australian furnishings? Exactly. So pretty much most of what you have in your house is actually not regulated. And it's not unusual for us to go in and do an audit. We did an order of a mattress factory about three years ago and the level of formaldehyde was 28 times above the exposure standard for a workplace. And it is a strong irritant, eye, skin and lung irritant and it is a known carcinogen. So they were selling 400 of these children's mattresses every week in Victoria. So this is why it's really important to first understand that most of what you find on a supermarket shelf has never been tested, and secondly, try and buy natural materials as often as possible and Australian made. Of course, we have perfumes and, and um, cleaning products and things like that, and we, women love to put a lot of stuff on their body. My next book is gonna be called Get That Shit Off Your Face and Your Body, pardon my <laughs> French, because it's amazing how women have been conned into putting all this stuff on their body when most men go, why does she wear that? If you actually ask the opposite sex, most men go, why does she wear that perfume? It stinks. Apart from the fact it's incredibly toxic. Plastics, perfume, pesticides, my top three chemicals of toxicity. And of course, bam, and your health is gone. My kids love that ad. Water. We put a lot of stuff in our water and chlorine is great to prevent the waterborne illnesses, but of course, chlorine is a very strong skin and lung irritant and it's not good for your gut microbiome. So if you don't get a filter, your body will be the filter. That's my motto as building biologists. You either get a filter or be the filter. That's what normally most of my doctors at the end of the medical conference start seeing. It's really important because of course there's so much stuff in our water supply and what the water suppliers don't tell you on their water sheet is that they're not testing your water from the tap, they're testing it at the reservoir. From the reservoir to your tap, you've got like 200, 300,000 kilometres of mains distribution pipe that probably has asbestos cement sheet that has galvanised iron that's rusting. Or in your domestic water, you have lead solder on your copper pipe. So there's lots of um, toxins in water that need to be purified so that your body isn't doing that. Nearly finished. Uh, biotoxins, really important to address this. One in two Australian homes have some degree of water damage. Absolutely disaster for chemical exposure because people in water damaged buildings, 24% of them can't create antibodies to mould, which essentially means that every time they're in a water damaged environment, it sets up an innate immune response and inflammation that doesn't shut down. <laughs> 
and the way, and that ultimately leads to this process, and I'm not going to test you on this, that's a good thing, <laughs> but just in a nutshell, Normal people tag their biotoxins in the water damage mould environment and they clear it through the bowel. People who can't do this, who can't create antibodies, result in inflammation that affects their ability to sleep, their pain, and uh, weird infections in the upper respiratory tract, etc., and fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue like symptoms. So, just to finish up, um, for clinicians, the way to take an exposure history is to have a look at where the patient lives, draw a box a half a kilometre either side, a kilometre up and down from the patient's home, and then check it against this, which only took me six months of research, to identify what the exposure zones are. So any clinicians in the room, that would definitely be worth taking a picture of or buy my book. Um, what is the exposure zone for pesticide drift, for wind turbines, airports, traffic related air pollution, and uh, exposure to AC magnetic fields and radio frequencies? Um, and all of that is in my book, just to take it to a whole new level of fear, with lots of great tips on how to address that. I'm currently just about to launch with my Professor Mark Cole, my supervisor, the Healthy Home Survey, which will provide a free report to rate how healthy is your home. And that is available um, in July. And that is it. Thank you so much. <laughs>